Hello, human peoples. You're listening to the podcast network of Gamefully Unemployed. Support us and gain access to great exclusive podcasts like Fox Mulder is a Maniac, Tom and Jeff Watch Batman, Star Trek The Next Futurama, and our latest show, Spiel Boys. Head over to patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed. We do game streaming, movie nights with our patrons every Friday night, and you can even commission your own podcast about anything you want. Literally anything, within reason, and we have to do it. You are quite frankly out of excuses not to go visit patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed. That's patreon.com slash G-A-M-E-F-U-L-L-Y unemployed, which is spelled like it sounds. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Doing good. Hey, everybody. Uh, My name is David Bell. I am guest co-host Jason Pargin. I I have not not permanently replaced Tom or anything. I'm just just sitting in. And, uh, (laughs) oh... We just watched American Psycho, starring Josh Lucas, America's sweetheart. New card. What do you think? Whoa. Very nice. Patrick, you're so sweet. Jean? Yes, Patrick? Would you like to accompany me to dinner? Sabrina, why don't you dance a little? Chrissy, get down on your knees. We're not through yet. Jason, thank you so much for being on here, by the way. Trying to watch Uh, a movie that is so pervasive in the culture that I could not remember if I'd seen it or not. Because so, so many of the scenes are so iconic and so, like, it's such a big part of meme culture and all that that... I literally, it, it lives in my mind, and I'm sure there's a lot of movies that are in this category for people. It's like, have I actually seen it, or have I just absorbed every minute of it through clips and osmosis it is and think pieces? so memed now. Um, and before we talk about it, I really quickly want to thank Harrison Millie. There are Patreon producers who picked this film. Harrison Millie, thank you so much for being a supporter and 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 letting us watch this movie which yeah i hadn't watched it in at least like 10 years maybe more and you're saying you're not even sure if you had watched it um and i get that because i it's one of those movies where it's almost like it's a weird comparison but like i haven't seen back to the future in a while and i don't feel like i need to because i'm like yeah i can just close my eyes and watch the movie where this is kind of the same feeling which is like the movie is always around uh and and so for whoever Everyone. suggested this movie for an episode that I was on, I worry that they are waiting to see if I liked the movie. It mm-hmm. is extremely difficult to judge a piece of art that has just been so it, like so many of these scenes don't have the emotional impact they would have had in the theater in the year 2000 because it's like, oh, here's the part where he chases her naked with the chainsaw. Here's the part where right. he talks about his morning routine. Here's the bit with the business cards which is a meme on TikTok today is pervasive. 23 years later, like that meme is one of the most popular memes of the thing with him comparing the business cards. And it, it's a it's a meme template where instead of the business card, it would be like a picture of their cat or something like that. Right. So when you actually see the business card scene, it is incredibly unfair to expect that to have any kind of emotional impact on me the way it's supposed to, because it's like, oh, he said the thing. It's like, oh, there's the, this is the part where he, you know, where, where he talks about his skincare routine. This is the bit where um, he does the Huey Lewis in the news bit while wearing the, the rain coat. Like, it, it's yeah, it, it's hard to, to judge, like, the impact it has because it's so lost. It's, it's, not, it's not fair to call it a cliche because it's not the film's fault. If anything, credit the film for making the stuff iconic. I was going to say, like, yeah, I get what you're saying where it's, like, personal – it's hard to judge personal impact, but I would argue this movie is a big success, right? Considering what we're saying about it, which is Ooh. that, like, y- this is a successful film. Um, I mean, okay, we need to talk about that maybe before anything else, because this film, when it came out, only made $34 million. I yes. mean, it made its money it, back, because it's a low-budget film. The budget was under $10 million, I think, but, like, it, it was successful. But if you look at the top grossing movies from the year 2000 and how many of those have been totally lost to memory... Or had no, like, you know, you're familiar with the franchise, but you couldn't tell you, you know, any people are not quoting lines from it. But for a movie that made that little money 
that 23 years later, it is a pervasive meme. The, the imagery is pervasive and iconic. Everyone can see that image of him standing there in the raincoat pointing at the stereo. They know exactly what movie it's from. It is fascinating to see as time goes on which films last in the memory and which films fade. For example, another example is The Big Lebowski, a very moderate success, very middling reaction from, from critics. I remember reading like three different reviews at the time that came out because I was trying to figure out if I wanted to render on DVD or whatever. And they're like, eh, it's got a couple of funny quotable lines, but it really doesn't come to anything. It's like now The Big Lebowski, again, it's a meme. There's lines. Everyone's heard of the movie. Like it lasts in the culture in the way that even other Coen Brothers movies don't. And in the way that movies that made 10 times more than it made at the time don't. And you never know what's going to stick. But American Psycho, yeah. whatever else you can say about it, good Lord, has it stuck in the cultural imagination. One of the ways that I've always tried to predict that pattern is just looking at past Oscar nominations. I always look at, um, for current nominations, what wins or what's up for best original screenplay. Because for whatever reason, best picture, that's not usually the film that no. like stands the test of time. It's usually the ones around screenplay, which is, means it's just the ones that are well-written. That Those are the ones like Pulp Fiction, uh, where, where like, uh, it's, always, it's always the indie film that they're like, we don't want to give you best picture, but everybody's talking about you, right? So at least that that's the pattern I noticed. And yeah, it's true. It's, I mean, that's one of the things looking at blockbusters a, it's like, what is going to sink to the bottom here? Uh, and the fact that so many blockbusters are interconnected, it's like, how does that work? You know, uh, how, how are people going to be like, you know, what was really good Thor three. I don't remember what came before or after that. Like, it's such a, I, I don't know. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I've always been wondering about like, what is now going to look like 30 years from now? Uh, if, for example, for that reason, for example, if you have Disney Plus, the show Andor is a wonderfully crafted sci-fi heist crime movie. That is a unique um, premise, and almost you know, I, I mean, how many similar movies are in? It, like it's almost its own genre. Great cast, great acting, great world building, but the fact that it is just part of the Star Wars Disney era conglomerate. And that it's just meant to be a prequel to Rogue One, a film that some people saw, most people forgotten. Like that, what could have been, if this had been like a 70s era sci-fi heist movie, it's something that I think could have been remembered as its own thing in the way that we remember Blade Runner as its own thing. But because it's just mm -hmm. one block in the giant wall of Disney's uh, Star Wars conglomerate, it's kind of just doomed to be another piece of streaming content. Right. And like, that's, yeah, that's the stuff where I'm like, it, it's stuff like um, physical home media. And like, I, I feel old saying this stuff because I do think there is an answer here. But for example, like, you know, HBO can just drop shows out of existence now. So it's, it's, it's not only that it's about like uh, the zeitgeist, about the culture around it, but like some films won't last because they just won't be around <laughs> Which is so weird in the digital age that that's even more of a concern. That at any point Amazon can say, we're going to drop this film and, and then you won't be able to have access to it. And no one's buying Blu-rays or DVDs or uh, uh, 4K, whatever them thems are. Uh, and so, I don't know, it, it feels like it's harder for something to have that kind of cult, like the cult falling that this did. Because as you said, this didn't do great at first and then it sort of blew up. Uh, I also want to, uh, so I, I want to share some behind the scenes with you, Jason, because uh, I think it's fascinating. Because we were talking before this, I, I had um, read the book. You hadn't, right? No. Yeah. I haven't read the book in a while, so I'm, I'm not going to speak to it too much, except to say that it has some of the most graphically upsetting violence in it. Um, one thing you might notice about this film is it actually cuts away from most of the violence, even th though there's violent scenes. Uh and I want to talk about why this movie is a su success, and I want to bring up three names that I think are directly responsible for that, and that is the director, Mary Heron, uh, that is um, uh, uh, Guinevere Turner, the, the co-writer. She, she wrote it with Mary Heron, and Christian Bale. And I'm not bringing up uh, the producers, 
uh or of course uh uh brett easton ellis uh who absolutely did not uh it doesn't seem appreciated this movie um i want to give you a quote from him this is an interview with him with movie line directly about mary heron uh quote there's something about the medium of film itself that i think requires the male gaze he goes on to say the male gaze and a male sensitivity i mean the best art is made under not an indifference to but a neutrality towards the kind of emotionalism that i think could be a trap for women directors that is his thought on the woman director of this and i think that is wild because <laughs> i think this is really well directed uh i don't i don't know if you noticed that about this film but i think the directing is incredible yes and everything i understand about brett easton ellis kind of makes him sound like a cartoonish goofball of a man who yes. ha like that i okay i i've not read one of his books the people who right. love his books love them dearly, and even people who know what they're talking about talk about the prose and about how beautifully crafted they are. I do not doubt he is a spectacular writer in some senses, but I I think that the book American Psycho, from what I understand, the whole thing that makes it special is its prose, is its descriptions of the graphic violence and all of that, and is not in its expert satire. Because I don't feel like listening to him and reading interviews with him about why he wrote it what or any of that, it just sounds like he's like, well, I was going through a very dark period in my life and I was obsessed with consumerism and I could feel myself falling into this trap. And so I, I started to have these violent fantasies and I wanted to write you know, a version of that. And that's it. it. It doesn't sound like he's trying to say all of these sophisticated things about the nature of the male gaze or masculinity or anything like that it sounds like in some ways the movie has a keener sense of what it's making fun of than he has because while again i know that the the book is a black comedy um i don't think it's making fun of the same thing that the movie is yes so yeah i i having read the book he is a he's a great writer like he absolutely is it's what's very funny to me is that quote i want you to keep that quote in mind because this it, it's not I'll, it's not about gender that's the whole point that's his mistake right um by making it about that but this is one of the few films where i feel like it really needed to pass through two women writers to really like make it what it is from a uh, female perspective and uh the, it's most evidenced by the production history, the pre-production history of this movie, which I want to take you through. Um, and I just remember that quote about him being like, they're too emotional. They, they can't get involved. So this was originally for David Cronenberg and Brad Pitt were going to make this. Uh, and they hired Brett Easton Ellis to make the uh, screenplay. Cronenberg then told Brett Easton Ellis, I don't want to see any scenes in the restaurants or nightclubs from the novel because he thought they were too boring and he also didn't want much violence. Um, and so uh, Brett Easton Ellis ignored all those notes. He called them insane. He then wrote a version that ended with a musical number to bury Manilow's daybreak on top of the world trade center. Uh, his reasoning for doing that, he later noted in an interview, uh, he was glad they didn't go with that ending. He also said he wrote it because he was bored with the source material, which is very funny to me because literally that's what Cronenberg said was this is boring. And he was like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. And then he wrote a script and then made it completely off the wall and said, yeah, I was, I was bored with it. So that script got thrown out. Uh, they then went to another writer, uh, who Cronenberg was so dissatisfied with that writer, he left the project. Um, Brett Easton Ellis then turned in another draft um, to the producer that they hated because they described it as completely pornographic. So like he lent, he l was leaning into like sex and violence. Um, finally. Uh, so like at this point, it's the movie, the production started becoming like poison where it's like they, they were saying like, this can't be adapted. Mary Heron shows up. She originally she she originally tried to read the novel but thought it was too violent. So she finally reread it and she decided this was a good idea. She said 
uh, there's just enough time to pass from the 80s to bring out the satire. So that was her first idea. Um, she read the existing drafts and was like, I think, like her biggest thing was that they seemed to miss the novels, uh, how the novel depicted social privilege. Um, and so she wrote it herself with Guinevere Turner, uh, who looked at it and said, the quote from her is, with the right spin, it could be a really subversive feminist movie. The producer at the time also commented that Mary Heron was out of everybody attached to it, the only person to ever convey a clear solution as to how to do it. Meaning that she was the only person that finally was like, here's how you make this. Um, and so you think like, okay, that's it. Movie gets made, right? Um, she also seemed to have a perfect understanding of Patrick Bateman in that she wasn't interested in like, oh, what, d- did he do the murders or not? What's going on in his head? She, none of that mattered to her. Um, she just thought of him as kind of a monster. She went to Christian Bale, who at the time was no name. He was in that Spielberg film, which was, you know, a big deal, but he was a child actor. Uh, he, she chose him for one of the reasons she said he was the only actor who, out of all the other actors she auditioned, uh, Christian Bale was the only one who didn't think Patrick Bateman was cool. <laughs> all the other actors apparently <laughs> did not understand that Patrick Bateman not cool, which is very disturbing uh, in terms of other actors. So, okay, we got our director. We got our actor. We're ready to go. In 1998, Lionsgate announced that Leonardo DiCaprio had been cast at ba- as Bateman without consulting Mary Heron. <laughs> they just decided they wanted him, and they insisted to the point that they went over her head and said it. They fired her because she said she would not make this without Christian Bale, the only person who seemed to understand the role. She was saying Leonardo DiCaprio, he had just come out of Titanic. It was, it, you know, it would have been, it's a distraction. He's got a baby face. Uh, it, it would have been, he's a teen heartthrob. It doesn't feel like it worked. So they fired her and they brought on, I believe, um, Oliver Stone. Oliver Stone and Leonardo DiCaprio wanted to make the film a, quote, Jekyll and Hyde-like story that was completely, like, missed all the satire of Heron's script. They spun their wheels so much that they, they left the project, once again, can't be made. We can't do this project. So Lionsgate rehired Heron and was like, we still don't want Bale, Christian Bale. They offered it to Ewan McGregor, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, Vince Vaughn, Edward Norton. Everybody declined. They went back to Christian Bale, who just coincidentally was like, oh, yeah, I didn't. I turned down every role uh, knowing you guys would come to me. They did. They offered him and paid him $50,000 for the role because they were so against him. 50K to play this role that, of course, blew up his career. Uh, and the budget was $10 million. That's how that's how much sh- this Mary Heron had to fa- fight to make this movie that is now like, yeah, you're right. It didn't do great at the box office, but this is a classic. Uh, and it's amazing that it was really Christian Bale uh, and Mary Heron and her screenwriter, Guinevere Turner, seems to be out of all of that, including Brett Easton Ellis, the only people who was like, I know how to make this a film. I know what it needs to be. Uh, and it's just really funny to me that after all that, Brett Easton Ellis is still like, I don't know about women directors. <laughs> and it's like, really? Because this woman kind of puts you on the map, I feel like. Like, I, I, I think that this movie has kind of surpassed his novel personally. So if uh, the listeners out there are saying, but what has Mary Heron, like, like, what was her reward for doing this movie? What other big blockbuster films was she allowed to direct? And as far as I can tell, not a single one. She went back yeah. to directing episodes of TV shows. Yep. And I don't know if some of it's, uh, was her sensibilities or not because she was talking about how like at the time every offer she was getting she found boring she clearly likes weird stuff um, but it is kind of incredible that her career did not explode after this um, but again I guess all they looked at was the box office um, but I find it, it it's just that's so <laughs> it's so incredible for me because again I think the the directing is spot on um, you might have heard the scene with Willem Dafoe. Have you heard about uh, this was something that's, again, all over Twitter, um, TikTok, which is that whenever Dafoe did a scene, she did three takes with him. One where he knew Patrick Bateman did the murders. 
one where he didn't think he did the murders and one where he was a little suspicious of him. And then she cuts between them. And that's like such a beautiful way to show that Patrick Bateman in his mind is like freaking out and doesn't quite know. Because of course this movie is all, I would say, would you agree with this? Is all through his perspective. It's an unreliable narrator. Okay, here's uh, where I agree with some things Brett Easton Ellis has said. Because he said that, that yeah. in his more like magnanimous moments, he said that if that they did okay, but that the book is unfilmable. Not because right. my amazing book is so good that movies can't capture it, but because the book is entirely about the interiority of this guy. It's entirely in his head and in his consciousness and in his thoughts. And the fact that he doesn't know what's real and what's not is easy to convey in a novel because you're just hearing his thoughts all the time. And the fact yeah. that he'll break off from whatever he's doing and do this long divergent model and get to the, the history of some pop star. Like, it's like, this is his thoughts. This is his crazy disconnected thoughts going on. When you're trying to bring that to film, as he has, he said, it's like, it's extremely difficult to shoot it in a way that it's not clear to the audience. Did this happen or did this not happen? Because for example, there's times you will cut away to other characters saying things that Patrick Bateman is not there to see. And it's like, well, if this is all hallucination, he didn't, see that. So why would he hallucinate right. something he wasn't in the room for? And Or you'll see something happening before he enters the room. And so you're cueing to the audience, oh no, this is what's, this actually did happen. So in, there's times in the film where it's like at the end, if you're truly trying to say it was all a dream or whatever, if you went back and watched it a second time, it's like, well, okay, but then why did, did he do some of the murders, none of them? Whereas the book, I, I think it's much easier to just say, we're inside of the head of somebody who doesn't know. He literally doesn't yeah. know what he did or didn't do. So you are stuck with his uncertainty and you are you know what it's like to be inside the head of this person who's just become disconnected from, from reality. And then in a film, it's just very hard. It's very hard to do that. There's even scenes in Fight Club, which does you know a very similar thing, obviously came out a year earlier, but that where the stuff happens that like Edward Norton wasn't there to see it happened behind him. But then later, that was part of his hallucination. But it's like, so he didn't notice his own hallucination. Right. It's just difficult to do with the language of cinema. That's all. It's it's not necessarily sure. their fault. Well, the novel Fight Club actually makes it more clear, too. Because I believe, I, I haven't read that book in a while, that Tyler Durden actually only shows up when he's dreaming. Like, I think that's the idea, is that, uh, I, I, again, I have to reread it. But it's, it's a, yeah, it's a lot easier to make it ambiguous in the novels for sure i do think she does a pretty good job in that at the end you really are like i have like i mean what would you like this time around i was i was watching it part of me is like i don't think he did anything um part of me thinks he didn't even like have sex like i uh, part of me is thinking he's not even because there's that scene at the end where the lawyer is like patrick bateman that dork and everybody whenever they're talking about patrick bateman not knowing that he's him they talk about him like he's this he's this sad little man. And so like, I'm, I'm wondering this time around, like, is he even, does he even look like Christian Bale? Like, is this all so incredibly in his head, but the movie definitely the, the probably the hardest part about watching this movie is the ending and being like, wait, what happened? Cause I've heard so many different, like that whole spectrum between did he do all the murders to it's all in his head and it feels like every time I watch the movie, I come to a different conclusion. And that's uh, the, the creators don't know one way or the other. It's like the ending of the thing. The point is they yeah. don't know, so you don't know. It, there's not like some, right. well, if we decode the film properly, we'll find the Easter egg that tells us. It's like, no, the, the point is he has lost touch with reality and prefers to think of himself as this monster when he's not. Right. It's like he wants to be like all of his big speeches about, you know, I am a predator walking in, you know, they don't know that I'm not a real human being. All I seek is blood and whatever. It's like, that's his fantasy because in yeah. reality, he's kind of not anything, you know, in, in the film. And I don't know if it's the same in the book. The film makes a big point of the fact that at his job, he doesn't do anything. They, they show his address book and it's just a series of lunches and dinners at restaurants. There's no other meetings. Yeah. 
His desk has no work on it or a computer on it. There's not a single sheet of paper on his desk or a pen. He has this completely clean desk and this completely clean office. And he's always just like watching TV in there or he's got his headphones on. And then it's it, they mention his dad basically owns the company. Like he's just a, a nepotism hire. So it right. goes out of the way to say that he doesn't have anything else to cling to. He has wealth he didn't earn. He has privilege he didn't earn. And so he's just kind of this empty person who doesn't affect the world. So his being a psychopath is his, you know, even like the corny title of the book movie, American Psycho, like that's what he would come up with. He would call himself that. And it's yes. like, no, it, it, in reality, he's probably the whole thing is he doesn't affect the world at all in a meaningful way. Yeah, that's one of the things I noticed this time, which is having not watched this in a, in a while, uh, his inner monologue is so incredibly edgelordy that, that I realized like, oh, yeah, he really isn't that cool. He's really he's really kind of a dork. Um, and and I, I guess part of the satire is the fact that he doesn't do anything, nor does anybody around him, you know, and he fits right into it. They're so incredibly interchangeable, like they, they're confusing each other. Uh, for each other they're always recognizing people at restaurants that may or may not be those people that it's all like again it what makes it work really well or well what makes it designed to be disorienting i think is the fact that you really truly can't like you don't understand the world he's in either right um like when he goes to uh what's his name paul jared leto jared leto's place paul allen, um, when it's, the paul allen yeah when it's being repainted like and the realtor is acting really weird and it's like okay is this in his head did they just like did they like like what exactly why is everybody acting so strange or again when he's being called davis at the end it's like okay is he actually davis or is he just being confused um it's it's because everybody's confusing everybody for everybody else and so like what's happening in his head the unreliable narrator is sort of uh uh blending so well into the world that he's in as well uh and again it kind of makes the movie very confusing but i just think it makes it really effective at the same time um she does a lot of little things like you mentioned the stuff where yeah like he'll say something like he says something to the bartender at the beginning uh and she doesn't react and but it's noisy in the club so there's again this idea of like we're in a club where ever nobody can hear each other and so that's a commentary but then it's the fact that, like, did he even say it? You know, is he just thinking it? And so that's, there's all this element of, like, plausible deniability she puts throughout. Again, at Paul Allen's place, they're repainting the apartment. So it's like, oh, did, they, did the crime get covered up? Did it get cleaned? Or did it never happen? They, they keep putting these seeds of doubt. And I think it's, you know, on purpose to be very disorienting. Um, but it, it, again, ultimately, the idea is, like, we just don't know, right? Now, um, there's oh, go on. Well, it, one strange thing is that uh, another thing that made it difficult to like watch the movie on its own terms, the publicity around this getting made was even if you didn't closely follow the trades or anything like that, you probably heard about because especially with Leo DiCaprio getting cast in it, because it's like Titanic heartthrob has been cast in the most disturbing movie ever made, the most gory, mm -hmm. violent film. So this film has a reputation as being over-the-top, horrific, violent, bloody, gory, but that's the book they're talking about. This film feels almost PG-13. Like, there are single episodes. I was episodes, about to say, yeah. There are single episodes of Game of Thrones. There are single 10-minute sequences in Game of Thrones that contain more disturbing imagery than this entire film combined. It is very tame for its subject matter, yeah. but the book is not. So I think a lot of the controversy around where it's purely about the gore and the shock value and all that, if you watch the movie for that, you're going to come away disappointed. I think part of it, so I've been, I was thinking about that because the director, of course, she was saying she didn't like the violence. Uh, and so there's probably a purposeful idea of like, like there's a part where he picks up that woman and then it's hard cut to him in his office holding a lock of her hair. And it was like, we really don't have to see anything else, right? And so it's it's this question of like, when does a movie just tr it's trying to like fetishize violence, right? That's just like, ooh yeah, look at these women getting beaten and 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 like getting hurt and like like the horror movie, the Texas Chainsaw of it all, um, which they do a little of it, but like it feels like part of it's like we don't need to see that, right? 
we don't need to see these scenes. We just need to see the reactions. Um, we just have to hear the sounds. And ultimately, I find that way more upsetting. Like the part where he kills the the homeless man and the dog, extremely upsetting. And the for me, what it is is that we don't see anything. That's the huge part. So it like it, yeah, it's it's funny how like this movie is associated with hyperviolence. And you're right. This is this could be PG thirteen. Like if they if they cut out some of the nudity, like this is not a violent movie at all. And that also plays into the idea of like what's a fantasy because none of it feels real ultimately because we don't see anything. We sort of it's all sort of from his perspective, um, and so nothing. And and since we yeah, like there's no like affirmations of of violence in the visuals ultimately that it just it, it i think it just plays into that idea of like what was real and what wasn't um it's a very interesting choice and it's it, it's cool to watch a movie that like manages to be associated with being one of the most violent movies while not showing that much violence at all like the the jared leto scene one of the most famous scenes from it uh nothing just blood yeah, I think if Brad Easton Ellis was on this podcast, one, it'd be a very different show. Um, yes, it would be weirder, yeah. But two, I think he would say that in the book, the reason there's so much lurid detail and it goes into such, such extreme detail about the methods and the, you know, because in the book, there's some cannibalism, things like that. Yeah. Is that once you find out he's been imagining this, the fact that he imagines it in such extreme grotesque detail is the point. That he's right. not imagining it as bloodless or, or anything like that, that he is reveling in the idea of, of putting his hands in the gore and, and of shooting a woman in the head with a, a nail gun and all that. In a film, if you shoot that, you automatically do kind of fetishize it and you appeal to the wrong audience who just likes to see gore for entertainment value. So that's one thing where I do not doubt he probably thinks the film was too tame but in a visual medium, it's hard to show it without – well, here's another good example. And in fact, here's an example where I, you could probably tell the film was directed by a woman. Is that when he invites the women or the sex workers back to his apartment for the threesomes and these things he sets up, how bored and kind of annoyed the women are through it. Yeah. <laughs> because they see right through him. Like this guy, like he's paying, but he's a phony. He's annoying. He doesn't have anything interesting to say. He's not fun. They're there to do it. And so when he's like making them get into position, he's like, you know, bend over and you look into her butthole. It, if I think a lot of men who directed that would try to make it sexy because it's like, hey, I want this scene to be entertaining. The way, you know, we've got two hot women here who are going to get mostly naked. The way we're going to make this entertaining is by making it sexy. And I think a woman director did a really good job of having these sex workers portray the exact level of annoyed we just have to get through this for the paycheck and yeah. move on to the next thing that you would that you would get because they don't find him charming they don't find this arousing at all anything about this guy like they've seen many guys like him they're not you know and they'll like make some comment like nice apartment like that's because they know that's what he wants to hear but it's like they don't care they're not going to get, get to live there it's right. he's paying them for a job and they're just mildly disgusted by it and it, it's it's great because he's so oblivious to their their level of excitement or enjoyment or anything that's really it's a key part because you're right is that instead of making it sexy it makes the scene funny and there this movie is extremely funny and i i know the uh the book is funny as well but i, I didn't the the humor in that is like it's a lot more quirky i guess uh or it's a lot more funny in how outrageous it is uh and so like it really a lot of it just comes from christian bale's performance of course who's just you know absolutely killing it and he does this like beautiful like weird manicness throughout like that's the other part about his characters he loves to call himself a sociopath or say he's like a monster in his inner monologue but he's extremely emotional which i love that combination that is a wonderful performance that is i believe huge part of why the film is remembered not to take anything away from the director because that performance is partially directed right like that's you know that was oh, a yeah. collaborative thing but his performance as the body he's inhabiting of an extremely handsome, powerful, strong man 
And all of his mannerisms and speech and everything he says is just the biggest nerd in the world. Every time he has to tell a lie, he tells the worst, dumbest lie in the yeah. In the worst way possible to the point where when he's stuffing a corpse into a trunk, a friend recognized him and said, like, Patrick Bateman, is that you? He says, no, it's not me. You're mistaken, Ted. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's so funny. And every lie he tells, like even when he's talking to the detective, he's so clumsy because he obviously sees himself as smooth operator, you know, super, super criminal. You know, I'm super intelligent. You're never going to catch me. I'm the perfect predator. And then every time you actually see him in action, it's just clumsy and goofy, and and it's and you realize, oh, the difference between what he thinks he is and what he actually is is portrayed in every every word, right? Even his own, it, like if you accept it as his own fantasies, like it's still he's so manic uh, and sweaty, and it really comes out like Christian Bale just his expressions, like just the last Willem Dafoe scene where he thinks Willem Dafoe is going to catch him. He looks just miserable uh, up until it like Willem Dafoe is like, uh, reveals that he has an alibi. It's so well done. And yeah, it's all like, this is one where it's like, yeah, obviously he was directed, but Christian Bale is sort of known for this, right? Like for this movie, they were like, you should get fit. And then he showed up looking like he looked, he had just done velvet gold mine. And they were like, Oh, okay like he had literally gotten like dental surgery for the role to like make his teeth nice uh and they're like well this isn't what we were sure like this is great uh little it would have been illegal for us to ask you to do exactly this but we're glad we did um yeah so he always gives it his all he apparently um uh one of the reasons brett easton ellis was like warmed up to the is he the first lunch he had with brett easton ellis about the movie he did it as patrick bateman which uh, couldn't have been fun. <laughs> like that is an unnerving din uh, lunch or dinner to have with Christian Bale. But that's like, you know, that's what he does. And if someone had uh, filmed, filmed that dinner secretly, I would probably have enjoyed that more than the film American Psycho. Just the, yeah, probably. the novelist Brett Easton Ellis talking to Christian Bale in character as Patrick Bateman and the two of them getting through. I guess part of it is I'm imagining them eating at like Applebee's or something. Oh, so that'd they, be amazing. They prob probably were not. But uh, no, I can imagine that would be one of the most awkward dinners ever had in the history of dinner. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Like that's uh, because that's also a real like, hey, cut the shit sort of thing. It reminds me of like when Daniel Day-Lewis was filming My Left Foot, his agent like stormed off the set because he refused to uh, not be in character. Uh, and that's a film where he plays a paralyzed man. <laughs> who can't talk and the agent is like listen man i'm just trying to get this information from you like i'm imagining he's trying to have like a very serious business meeting uh actors sound exhausting absolutely exhausting uh yeah, but you Brett know Easton Ellis also sounds exhausting so these two yes. these two exhausting <laughs> men having a long dinner together and one one of them is doing the annoying method acting thing uh right it just had to have been wonderful for sure but yeah i mean like I do get like you know obviously Brett Easton Ellis sounds like not uh, not a person I get along with but like he's having so he's having his book adapted and I get that like I mean uh, you would know more than me the idea of like the lack of control you have the fact that you just have to kind of like see it out see it through and um this always happens like I always think of again uh, the shining where it's like Stephen King like famously like not very satisfied with this incredible classic horror movie based on his work um and so i get that where it's like but it isn't my story and i think that was that's what's so funny about this is this feels like one of the cases where someone had to step away from it to understand it right because it sounds like in pre-production of this movie the constant question was how do we do the violence this is unfilmable and the answer as we talked about was a director who came along and said why do we need to do the violence? Like, and like, I think in some conversations, people would be like, what are you talking about? That's what the book is, right? Like, that's the big thing in the book is this hyper detailed uh, uh, paragraphs about horrible acts of violence. And like, why, who would ever think of cutting that out? And then in retrospect, it's so obvious that that's, that was why the movie was struggling in pre-production so much is this need to like, to, to to adhere to that 
Uh, and like, I don't think it need it necessarily needed a woman to do that. But I think that in this case, considering the subject matter and stuff, it really, really helped uh, to like take that source material and give it that perspective. I I want to take a couple minutes to explain the shining thing because that is a yeah. wonderf- wonderful example of where film is great, the book is great. They're very different. What Stephen King said is not, you know, Stanley Kubrick is a bad filmmaker, he corrupted my movie or whatever. Is that Stanley Kubrick was not interested in these characters as human beings because The Shining is about alcoholism. It is about yes. living be feeling trapped in a life with an alcoholic where it absolutely feels like you're trapped in a life with someone who is possessed by a, a demon, a monster. Yeah. It, it is in that this isolation and then the history of what Jack has been through, what his own life was like with his father, all of these weird things. And then, you know, it, it is about a marriage. It is about a haunted marriage. And then the monster stuff is just there to be a Stephen King novel. But it stems from the fact that this is a it's not about a haunted house. It's about a haunted marriage. The film Stanley Kubrick does not make that kind of movie. He is like this is a very detached cold film where the location is the most compelling character in the film. The mm-hmm. snow, the, those hallways, those spaces, it is about a haunted building and these visuals and, and just the 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 coldness of that place and the emptiness and then just how it's haunted by and then all, all the little stuff he threw in, like the Native American you know imagery and all of that. It, it is a completely different feeling, a different type of creepy, a different type of horror, a different type of story that happens to have the same character setting plot. I think people who don't write or are not really into creative like works like that don't necessarily understand how you can have the same events, plot, story, and then have two different adaptations that are focused completely on, on having two totally different emotional impacts. And are coming at it from two completely different directions. I think that's what happened with American Psycho. I don't know that yeah. either one of them is wrong or that one's better than the other, but they are very clearly trying to leave you feeling two different things. Yeah, and it it does start at what are they trying to say? Because Kubrick, I mean, I'm a fan of his work, but what's interesting about him is like whenever I say to myself, "What does this movie mean?" It does feel like it never means something hyper specific. It's not a it's not like oh this movie is about alcoholism. It's a series of like uh very intentional um ideas, but they don't necessarily amount to, you know, it's not Jordan Peele, you know? Uh he's not saying something extremely specific. Whereas you're right, The Shining the book uh, uh 100% saying something very specific, but when you read that book, I'm sure you saw the mini series that they made, you realize like that doesn't really work as much cinematically. Yes. And yeah, I do think, yeah, Stephen King never like said anything terrible, but with Kubrick, like he's like it must be frustrating when someone like Kubrick, who's bigger, he's he's the biggest part of the movie suddenly, and he it's he takes it over, right? Like it doesn't feel like a Stephen King movie; it's a Kubrick movie, uh, and like uh, you know that's got to be just a weird experience for sure. Uh, and this, yeah, I don't think this is any different in that like what she she's actually trying to say something i would say more hyper specific or like to to think of her versus kubrick something um like again kubrick's like set design the stuff he does it's all like okay we want this house to feel like a maze we the native american imagery um again all kind of like so many different interpretations whereas like i don't know if you saw this it was uh uh, uh my partner showed me a tiktok of a girl going over the set design of Patrick Bateman's apartment. And one of the cool things is every piece of art he has reflects the idea of like an empty shell of a person or of trying to be a certain thing. Uh, And so like there's stuff like that in this that's like so hyper intentional uh, towards the one specific message. Like I feel like it's almost reversed where again, I haven't read the book in a while, but the book was almost like The Shining where it's like vibes more. It's more of like this general... It, it didn't feel hyper specific in its message. And if you've read the book and I'm wrong, I apologize. Like I, again, it's been 10 years since I read the book. That's just how I remember it. Uh, and that, yeah, you're right. In the end, they're two very different 
things, but they're both they both really work well. And I think if you tried to make like an American Psycho mini series, bait like and you tried to be like really, uh, you know, like uh, really tried to adapt the book, it just wouldn't work. It would just be a mess. I think. That said, I would have been fascinated to see what David Cronenberg did with it. Yeah, where, who he he is Holy very. Shit very fascinated by telling stories through gore and flesh and corrupted flesh and letting that be the theme where the gore is, you know, and then the way he would film it, like where it's like, is this something imagining what it would be like to chop off a head or is actually what it would be like? Like you may get over the top and cartoonish. Are you you know conveying that like this is his fantasy and he's obsessed with the idea of destroying flesh and that kind of thing? But because otherwise, the note that you take, I want you to take out the restaurant, the nightclub scenes is insane. Yeah. The, the entire point is that Patrick Bateman's entire life is just a series of dinners and drinks at nightclubs. Like that's, he has no family, he has no long term relationships, he has no real friendships, he has no real career. He just shows up at an office and kind of kills time until it's time to go to lunch and then kills more time until it's time to go to a club. And that's it. Like, like the entire point is how banal everything about his life actually is and then why he would then yeah. escape into some fantasy of but what if i was history's greatest monster um because that would be preferable to him then the reality which is that he's this guy who wakes up does his skincare routine stresses out about how his business cards are not as nice as his co-workers business cards you know doesn't really understand his business he's not become great at anything you know he's not really bringing anything to the table for anybody that he would prefer to be a monster than to be that than to just be the the empty suit that the film keeps hinting he really is yeah there's yeah um that was something i was wondering about because when he starts falling apart really in this movie it's when he starts like kind of refusing like you know like he brings his assistant in and he's gonna shoot her with the nail gun and then his fiance calls him and uh he's like he actually is like you need to leave because i'm afraid something bad will happen to you um and like that's i love that scene for is it real or not where you realize like maybe he never killed anybody in the movie but maybe that scene is the closest he actually gets to committing a real murder but then he also breaks up with his fiance and it's like these are the parts where he starts really like falling apart and it feels like it's it's like happening at the same time he's sort of rejecting the ideas of what of like his urges or what he should be doing like he knows he should be marrying this woman but doesn't want to um and then i think he that's when he has the scene with um Samantha Matt Mattis Mathis from you know the Super Mario Brothers movie uh who who like she she's kind of displays more agency uh to him as well like it feels like when he starts breaking apart is when like the world itself he's also rejecting like the social world around him that i thought was interesting um real quick though i want to go back to what you said about cronenberg have you seen the movie dead ringers long long time ago yeah that is i i would argue that is david cronenberg doing his version of american psycho um because that movie is jeremy irons basically playing well he's playing twin brothers uh who are very american psycho very patrick bateman so i feel like that that would be the closest and dead ringers is actually not a very gory movie it doesn't show a lot of violence uh and so i think like he made that in 1988 i don't know when they made this but i'm assuming he kind of it's uh, like not too far apart. And so I think that's what he had on his mind with his version. That's my guess. I still would have loved to see it. I kind of want to see every version of this, like the Oliver Stone version, the Leonardo DiCaprio version. I think we did get the best version, though. Oh, yeah. It, it, and we got the best Patrick Bateman. I do think a lot of actors would have done They would have each brought their own version of it. I don't think anybody would have given you this one, the one that sticks in your in your brain um yeah. because the character of you know normal businessman by day by day and murderer by night like that is a character that would turn up in many thrillers many crime tv shows it's not it, on its own is not that big of a deal but there is a corniness to the way christian bale portrays all of this and a goofiness that 
is just perfect. It is such a contrast to everything about how he looks and his body. And it's like this very threatening face and body with just the goofiest mannerisms. And he is playing a like the nerdiest version of himself. And the more dangerous he's getting, like the closer he is to doing violence to someone, the goofier and more off-putting he is. Yeah. And you can see him being so bad at like talking to people and and all of that it is it's just it's just perfect and then you contrast that to the actual violence it's like no it makes sense that he he wants to be the naked man chasing a woman down a hallway with a chainsaw because at least then he would be something kind of unique and interesting and different instead of the guy he is which is someone who's just sort of floating through life and just taking up resources and not, yeah, and, and then maybe doing paperwork on some mergers and acquisitions that he doesn't seem to understand. You know, you never hear him like talk about business in a way that makes him sound knowledgeable or anything else. It's just, right. <laughs> it's just the job that pays him tons of money and lets him live this this lifestyle and eat at these fine restaurants. And then his whole, you know, there's a running bit through the movie. There's this one restaurant he can never get res- reservations to. Because he doesn't Dorcia, have, yeah. yeah, he doesn't have the right connections or whatever. It's like in his real life, it seems like the primary struggle in his world is trying to get into that restaurant, and his primary frustration is the fact that he can't get in, and it's making him look like a fool because his lesser friends are able to do it because they are cooler, or they they've got friends on the inside or something. And it's like to to choose between living a life where that's his primary struggle versus I'm a secret serial killer. Of course, he chooses the fantasy. Like, yeah, it's he. It, it, if you're a narcissist, the knowledge that you're kind of not anything special is the is worse than death. Right. Yeah. They do such a, the, the business card scene. I mean, it's just so uh, <laughs> his, his, his pure rage over it. It's so good. It I, I, I really think like we didn't talk enough about Christian Bale. It's hard. It's it, it's hard to know what to say about it. Other than this is like, he was told, he was told this is career death. Uh, and it's like, this is the performance of a lifetime with him. Like, this is probably one of the single best performances he's done. Like, I think that's why I go back to like, it really came down to those three people because it's the writing, it's what he's saying, and then who's saying it. And like, you know, nothing against like um, the director. Obviously, she did a great job. I love the little things. Something I noticed this time around. Did you notice at the end, um, they sit down and they're drinking beer and then the friend says, I need a scotch. And then he's uh, Christian Bale's holding a scotch in the next shot uh, that he never had. Like little things like that throughout the movie. The, it's like really well directed. Again, really well written. But I think the reason this movie is a meme, the reason that Huey Lewis scene is a classic, it really comes down to Christian Bale. Like I think that if you had all the same elements, but Leonardo DiCaprio, he's a terrific actor terrific actor i think it's still like it really came down to him uh and how he played this role is what like resonates uh with this movie even now i think they would have taken it if they had been the same as if they'd been cast to play the devil in a movie to play satan Mm -hmm. it's like i'm i'm the suave evil gentleman but i've got evil in my heart but i'm outwardly cool and smooth i don't think they would have played patrick bateman as a dork even though that's yeah. clearly it's a plot point, like like he's you know the final scene, he's trying to confess his murders to his lawyer, and, and one his lawyer isn't clear on which guy is Patrick Bateman, and then two he's like Patrick Bateman is like the biggest nerd we know, like that's that's a joke, right? Um, I don't, I think they would still have been tempted to be like, no, he he can move in high society because he's he's a chameleon, you know, he's mastered right. the art of being smooth and cool. It's like no, he's a nerd, he's a dork, he he, he doesn't know anything about what about what he's doing, about what cool is or what what charisma is. He, it's all phony. It's all products. The mm-hmm. only objection, by the way, if I if they if I were handed final cut of this movie, which by the way would have confused the studio a lot if they had brought, brought right, me if they said, passed hey, it on to you. Yeah, yeah. We, we found this guy uh, working <laughs> on an insurance company. We want him to have final cut. The one thing I would have done is most. Like there's some iconic voiceover scenes that I assume it's text taken straight from the the book. I could be wrong. I get why it's there. Totally, yeah. you're, you're hearing his internal monologue in scenes like the business card scene. You don't need it. I I understand in the script why you think you need it because his monologue about 
my God, the the the, the linen background with, with the embossed lettering, you know, and he's like shattered. His soul is shattered that this guy's business card is so much nicer than his. Christian Bale's performance when he holds up the other guy's business card and his hand is trembling and he starts visibly sweating. That's all you need. That it's, it's so much funnier if you don't hear his thoughts in that scene. You don't need it. Because you know, I think that's something that would have only been clear in the editing bay. It's like, oh, he sold that non-verbally so well to where he like hands the card back and tries to like play it off as, as casual, like very nice. And, and you can yep. see that he's like about to have a stroke. It's all in the it's all in the face acting. It's all there. You don't need any of that. And again, I think it's probably text lifted straight from the book. It's probably like in the book. Uh, classic famous monologue you can tell me if i'm wrong if you remember um i don't quite remember but it is i think that's i think it's like the question of the violence where there's probably a feeling of like of course we'd leave that stuff in why would we take that out that's the best part of the book you know what i mean where yeah i'm guessing that's in the book and it i, I you're right i think you're right but i think like that would have never occurred to them at the time, I don't think, because I, I'm sure in their head, they're like, the dialogue is the, one of the strongest parts. Um, I'm sure, like, from what I can remember from the book, there was definitely, like, uh, like the ending monologue is different in the book, or, or the ending, uh, you know, uh, yeah, monologue. Uh, there are, they did, they did take liberties, I'll say that, uh, but I do think it's, it's definitely at least getting the vibe of the book. Uh, uh, again, I haven't read the book in a while, so feel free to comment about this. Um, but you're right. Like that is, that would have been so much funnier without anything. And just the music, you know? Uh, ah, damn, that is a good note. And it's the same thing uh, with, well, like his morning routine. You, you don't necessarily need to hear him explain all of the yeah. different products he uses on his face. You just, just just silently watch him going about his morning routine, and you see him doing the the crunches and the stretches, and he puts the ice pack on his eyes, and then he he applies eight different layers of skin products. Just show him doing it. Like it's all it's all there. You don't need him like narrating. You know, then I do this, then I apply this, then I apply. Like man, just just show him because it just keeps going, and his routine is so insane. Yeah. And everything about Here's his apartment, well, it's it's yeah. I know why they did it, though, because the whole thing is about an unreliable narrator, and you can't have that without reminding people that there's a narrator. Um, it that's also true. feels very 2000s, because Fight Club does the same thing, right? Like, that's that was kind of of its time, too, of like this, this kind of weird narration style. I feel like we don't get that as much. Um, yes, and... Let's let's talk about it. this film. Does have things about it that are dated, and you're gonna say, "Well, yeah, it takes place during the 1980s." It's okay. It's dated in two separate ways. One, it's intentionally dated because it takes place in the 80s and is capturing. It takes place in 1987, so it's capturing a specific era in a specific place. But then the film was made in 2000. Right. So it's dated in the sense that it's a very much a 2000 year 2000 film. That's interesting to me because the film, you know, the book was written in 1991. So it was written to be, you know, in the time it took to write the book, it was contemporary. It gets published in 91, which is, you know, it's only a few years later from when it takes place. So it wasn't like a period yeah. piece. It's like, this is the era of when what I was writing about when I wrote it. Then it takes almost a decade to get the film made, but they've been trying to make it that whole time. It's gone through just a bunch of drafts of the script and all that. But and as you, you had a quote from the, the director where she's like, well, it's now been long enough that it's a period piece, which yeah. it wasn't written as one. It wasn't written like, hey, you know, like like now when Hollywood does, you know, Babylon, or it's like about, about the golden age of Hollywood. It was written in its present day. And it's like, well, now it's been long enough. We're actually writing about the past because the year 2000 felt like a different era from the year 1987. I know it was only oh, yeah. 13 years later, but I'm telling you, it was such a shift in sensibilities from the, like the 80s era pop culture to the 90s grunge era. And the, we were in the, the Matrix. Yeah, the the Reagan yeah. years to the Clinton years and, and all of that. Like it was such a huge pivotal change during that that very brief stretch of time that now it's like, okay, in the 2000s, we are now making 80s parody stuff. So they are trying to convey what a ridiculous era this was. But then there are things when you watch it and, and you realize, for example, there's a couple of times where they reference 
someone taking mental health medication as being like a terrifying, chilling, weird thing someone would do. Yes. Because it's like a warning sign. There's a point where part of showing us that he is a psychopath is he openly – that he watches uh, pornography. He's watching an X-rated film on his television, which is clearly something only a depraved serial killer would do. Right. Which in the era when you used to have to go in New York, go down to like a weird adult sex shop to buy a tape from you know the, the counter and like step over five homeless people to get back to your high rise to watch it. Yeah. It's weird that you would go through that much effort to get a triple X movie, but whereas now, well, you know, there's people listening to this while they're they're watching porn on their computers. So there there are things like that where it's interesting because that there's two different types of dated. Where in the 2000s they're trying to make a movie about a different era, but then the filmmaking sensibilities in some ways portrays a different era. Like if American Psycho was made today, still set in 1987, it would be very different like they would make very different choices yeah yeah and there's some like there's obviously homophobia during it but that's intentional it's the 80s um there's a funny quote from the director she said some people had uh gotten upset with her about making patrick bateman homophobic and she was like i thought that was weird because they didn't have a problem with him being a murderer uh (laughs) but like yeah he's a bad guy but you're right that the 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 specific what you just identified like the porn and and taking medications is something that's like nowadays we're like that's not that's fine that's you know that's not like a a a terrible thing that says this person is depraved or or awful or broken it's still very it's still dated it's not as dated as i thought it was gonna be uh which was surprising as well it's also you you just made me realize that if this film was made today it would take place in like 2008 and that really bums me out i i don't yeah see it's there's that's i know it's se- all you know that's a whole separate conversation because the question of has yeah. the culture changed that much since like 2008 was like right on the cusp of the social media era so that would be the big difference but in terms of yeah you're yeah that's true because 1987 to 2000 like the action movies they were making in the 80s versus the stuff they were making in in uh, the 2000s it was a world of difference the, the type of music yeah. they were making and even though the, the same some of the same bands were operating it doesn't matter like there was such a pivotal it was almost like anything made before um vietnam and like the hippies free love era and anything made after the 1950s feel like 200 years ago as opposed to being you know that 15 years before the stuff that was made in the 1960s there's just like a sea change in the culture and, and so that is that is interesting because like I can watch a film set in 2009, 2010, and the only thing You're that you right. really notice missing is that they don't have they don't have smartphones. They don't have, uh, you know, a TikTok or Twitter or whatever. But, you know, fictional characters tend to not have that anyway. Yeah, you're right. Is I, I think that is a different conversation, but it's very fascinating where I think it kind of comes down to technology. I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of things, but when you think about like the technological difference, what computers, the internet did from like the eighties to like two thousand, like to probably the mid two thousands. Um, and then after that, it's like, yeah, everybody has a cell phone. Maybe the cell phone looks different. Um, everybody has the internet. Uh, maybe the web pages look different, but it's all, it does, it does start like everything starts kind of calming down a bit in terms of the culture. And I, I, I I'm sure there's other things to blame there. But I feel like it's a big part of it was we were making all these big leaps. Like when he says, I have to return some videotapes. When does this take place? Like, I'm pretty sure videotapes were actually pretty pricey then. Right? Like that it's actually kind of a status thing too. Um, I might be wrong there. Because I know that when VHS first came out, it was very expensive. But it might have already been affordable by, what is this, 87? Yeah, right. 80. Yeah. He was talking about renting them. And then the, the issue is if you kept a videotape and didn't return at all, they would charge you a uh, hundred dollars because they right. like a not the, the tapes that they were giving out for rent were different than what you get in retail. They were more expensive and more durable, I think. So right. but his whole thing was like, I have to return some videotapes. I feel like in in the if that's a recurring theme in the book then the joke is this is how we're living now we've always got to be returning these tapes because we're all watching home video um and right. then the joke that the tapes he's talking about returning are porn tapes right and texas chainsaw massacre and yeah 
Uh, yeah, the other yeah, things he's watching Texas. Yeah, Pink Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, it's which sign of, foreshadows the yeah. Um, yeah. So it's another thing where it, it at the time it was written that joke plays different than what because it's like such a weird excuse he keeps using to have to not do things or get away from things or to not talk. Yeah. to someone. It's like I got to return some tapes, and it's almost like if you're writing the script in 1987, it's almost a joke. Like you know. We're all watching these tapes now. It doesn't crazy how these this VHS has taken over our lives. We're now watching it right. in a totally different era. It's not even necessarily clear what what the joke's supposed to be. Like, is that a pathetic thing to be doing, or is that the joke being that you've heard people constantly complaining about this? I think part of it is still because, like, often when he says that, he's like out and about, and he he doesn't have any videotapes. Like there's a there's an element of like yeah I guess he might go back but like it's the same where he keeps saying he has appointments at restaurants where people are like isn't that on the other side of town aren't you gonna be late where like his alibi is like you said his excuses are terrible all the time so I think that's part of it too is that it's like he keeps saying it it's like it's like George Costanza with, Costanza with Vandalay the name where it's like it's his it's his go to alibi uh, and it's just kind of weak and weird. So that's the other part of it, but uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what initially they were trying to say there. It yeah. still works. One thing, uh, or at least like one big one, maybe one last big thing I wanted to talk about, if it's okay, is yeah, perfect. When trying to look up other think pieces pieces about this or YouTube essays about this, there's a whole lot of something that I have come to detest, which is. Every frame of this film must be symbolic. Like he represents the, the the nature of capitalism and how it devalues human life and all that. Obviously, a satire is referencing things in the real world. Obviously, it is making fun of real trends, real people, the way real people act, all sorts of things like that. But also, also, sometimes a story can just be about this one crazy guy going crazy in a really specific way. And it doesn't necessarily have to transfer frame by frame, one to one with Reaganism or anything like that. It, it, I feel I know that our work at Cracked helped bring this type of criticism <laughs> into the world because part of what I've always found fun is not not to deconstruct a movie to take the joy out of it, but to find more joy in it. It's like, yeah, this is really cool. But also, did you know this is symbolizing this? You know, that the Game of Thrones is roughly based on the War of the Roses. You know, it makes you want to go read about that. It, it's it's kind of right. interesting how he took that and put his own twist on it and and you know how that the whole map of Westeros kind of vaguely resembles the map of Europe at the time, and this represents that. But then once you take it too far, it's like, okay, well then you're saying the wall represents uh, like like border like a border and immigration policy or or is, is the wall is the ice wall brexit? It's like no, he he's taken something in the real world and amped it up to crazy levels. And then mapped on something from his own imagination onto it. And then at that point, it becomes just its own thing. It is fine to read a book about a guy who is having, you know, crazy hallucinations and to see what it would be like to inhabit that person's shoes as somebody who doesn't know, are they going crazy and they're losing their touch with reality? Or are they going crazy and that their actions have become violent or, or whatever, and that, that this person, part of their suffering is that they don't know. It's fine yes. for that to just be a story. It doesn't have to be, not everything has to be like, well, here's my statement on modern masculinity. It can just be an individual. Right. So this is, I'm, I like that you brought this up because it's a, it's a balance because like when you think about making a movie, like when a director sits down and they're making a shot list, uh, this is their job, Right. Like, this is their nine to five. They have all the time in the world, all day to do this. So when you're doing that, if you're a good director, you are asking the question, what should this stuff mean, right? And like, usually that has to do with the language of cinema of like, how do I convey an emotion in the scene? Not what does this symbolize in like American society? You know what I mean? Uh, where it's like, oh yeah, when a character is going left to right, it means that it feels like they are pursuing something when they're going right to left. We naturally, because this is the way we read, we think they're going away from something. So, like symbolism like that. And like 
we talked about The Shining. There's a documentary called Room 237, and it's about people's obsession with analyzing The Shining, which, again, Kubrick is a very intentional visual director, but people take it way too far at the same time. There's a good one where someone was talking about how Danny's uh, sweater is like uh, about the moon landing because it's the Apollo rocket. And there's like a theory around uh, Kubrick confessing that he faked the ro- the moon landing. And then you find interviews with the costume designer and she's like, oh, I knitted that uh, the night before. And I brought it in and said, hey, Stanley, can we put this on the kid? And he was like, oh, yeah, that's something a kid would wear. And that's it. <laughs> that was the decision. So it's this thing where it's like, yes, people are very intentional. Like I mentioned, the art in Patrick Bateman's uh, apartment very intentional but it's like yeah there's a limit you know they're not trying to tell a story an elaborate story in every shot and that is it is like because i think this movie invites that right because there are intentional things she did in the directing uh but it, it, just like kubrick uh it's easy to like go way overboard when you start picking up on anything uh it's a similar thing with uh there will be blood paul thomas anderson's it, it, like it's it's ultimately a story about this man this oil man and his life and the way he approaches the world and it's there's so much analysis where it's like this is about oil and, and the oil industry and like the corrupting forces of capitalism it's like no it's it, like it, that stuff is there that's the society he lives in but it's a study of this man who can't he's so driven he doesn't know what he's driven Toward. He can't connect with people. He can't connect with humanity. He, he he is relentless about pursuing success and power, but doesn't know why, doesn't know to what end. He In the end, he's just miserable and alone, that fabulously wealthy, driving away even his own, you know, like even his kid. You don't need to say, well, you know, this is like the way Exxon <laughs> or, or the way OPEC, you know, causes all of us to right. be disconnected from our humanity via our cars. It's like, no, it is a study of a human being. And American Psycho can, to some degree, be that. It, it doesn't have to be saying, well, you know, consumerism actually turns us all into serial killers. It's like, no, this is a guy who, for whatever reasons in his specific life, has become disconnected from his humanity and from other people. And it's therefore has become something monstrous because he doesn't know how to express himself. He doesn't know how to present himself to other people. He doesn't understand. He, he doesn't understand that other people are full human beings. Um, thus, part of the theme of him like confusing people for each other, that kind of thing. Um, right. If any. Oh, sorry. If, if anything, that's the starting point, right? Like you mentioned, there will be blood. That feels like it starts with like we all know the oil business is is bad. Like, it's that idea where it's like, we all know that what Patrick Bateman does on Wall Street. We know what this is. We don't need to explain to you that it's bad. Like, it's it's where they, it's like, it's, it's yeah, it's, the movie doesn't have to convince us of that. Um, so the question, if someone has been listening this entire time to find out if I liked the movie, <laughs> if I had watched it when it first, I wouldn't have seen it in the theater, but if, if when it first came out on video, say around 2001. I think my impression then would have been, well, Fight Club is saying the same thing and does it better because because American Psycho is about the past, about the 80s. Fight Club is about the future. It's like this is where we're going. Like you are like the, the whole reason Fight Club didn't make more money at the box office is that it came out like 15 years too early. 1999, yes. like to come out before the social media era, everything it says about, well, my entire life is just built around an aesthetic. And I don't even prefer these things. I, I buy them because somebody told me I want them. It's like, good God, to, to say that before Instagram, it's like, no, you 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 were too early. So I would have said Fight Club is, is just a better version of this because it's it's saying everything, it, like projecting like this is where the world is going, whereas American Psycho is kind of uh, looking back like weren't the 80s crazy. I think that would have been short-sighted because I – at the time, I wouldn't have been thinking of American Psycho as this iconic piece of art that everybody still talks about. It would have just been like one of the movies that are out now. I don't know how much of an impression it would have made on me because I would have felt like, well, again, the, the theme of the psychopathic businessman, the person obsessed with aesthetics to the at, you know at the cost of their humanity. Like I've seen all this before. It's okay as an execution of it. Christian Bale, this guy's really going places. He'll make a great Batman someday. 
um, I would have said, no doubt. Uh, yeah. That I don't miss what? to watch it now. It's uh, it's almost meaningless. It's like I, I don't remember if I've seen The Godfather all the way through. But if I sit down and watch it, it's like, oh, here's the offer you can't refuse part. Here's the part where right. everybody gets shot at the toll booth. Here's the part where he has the heart attack. Like it just doesn't. It does it, the same way I can watch Jaws. You think I'm scared of the shark anymore? <laughs> and like, oh, here's where the shark bites the guy in half. Here's where the shark pops out of the water while he's trying to chum the the waters. Here's where they. They shoot them with the harpoon guns or whatever. It's just all – it's just, it's the brain doesn't work that way. You can't be shocked by something you've seen 50,000 times. Uh, so, all right. Between Amer American Psycho and Fight Club, can you at least definitive, definitively say which one does a better job at just the main character creaming Jared Leto? Because <laughs> that happens in both. Yeah. It's, there's probably an IMDb list somewhere of films that someone <laughs> – uh, just brutalizing Jared Leto. And you can sit down and do a movie night. Uh, yeah, of, of I would Oliver. throw, by the way, American Beauty into the mix too, right? Because it's narrated. Uh, it's similar themes. It's it's again, it's real. It's one of those things where we look back and it's very funny to see these movies about like rich guys being like, "I'm bored with my life," <laughs> and it's and it's it's a very it's a very 2000 sensibility um and we loved it at the time and so like for that reason i think even fight club um like i loved fight club when it came out but i think at the time it also kind of got lost in the shuffle because everybody was talking about american beauty which is going back to our thing with the academy awards and stuff did i assume that at least got nominated right oh american beauty won everything yeah which is very funny in a in a year where american psycho and fight club also came out touching on very similar subjects uh, and, and american beauty it has aged poorly for other reasons yes uh, it actually might be one of the most the only thing the only piece of pop pop culture that has probably aged more poorly than american beauty is the entire cosby show tv series yeah um yeah it, because it's it's kevin spacey uh heroically trying to sleep with his daughter's friend and it's like my goodness <laughs> Um, and also the way it, uh, it, it's okay. We could do a separate American beauty episode someday. We could. That's a film that when I saw it, I didn't get why everyone was in love with it other than it spoke to a certain demographic. It's like, well, we're the ones who are really suffering. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't, wasn't crazy about it at the time, but I thought, well, yeah, but it's kind of also about, um, you know, this uh, like the, there's the man who's like trying to discover his sexuality, and he's it translates into violence, and it's tragic. And there's there's some good stuff in there, and then about the detachment you feel when watching things through a, a video camera is something that would become again very important to the world later. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I at the time it's like this is for someone else like i don't i didn't sympathize with kevin spacey's character and about how his job wasn't fulfilling it's like well this is basically prison this cubicle where i'm making hundred thousand dollars a year it's like no no prison prison is like prison if you want to know right. what prison if you want to know <laughs> what it's like to live in a prison go to prison uh then you'll see it's actually totally different it's a very different thing but i get there were a lot of people at the time eager to hear that message where it's like well you know yeah. just just showing up to an office every day and doing work for you know, for what a big, beautiful home with six right. bedrooms and your and your beautiful children and your wife who isn't really happy with you and you're you're unfulfilled. Like, okay, that's that's fine. There was a time when apparently people <laughs> really needed really needed to hear that. Right, we were just at that point where we could say that. But yeah, it is really funny. I looked it up: best picture, best director, best actor, best original screenplay, which surprised me. Best cinematography. It won all of those. It was nominated for three other things. Annette Benning was nominated for Best Actress. And like nothing against that movie, but it's fine. <laughs> like I yeah, I, I'd say I I enjoy Fight Club and American Psycho better than that movie. Not that we have to compare them all, but it's just very funny that they're all swimming around the same ideas and only one of them blew people away at the Oscars. Uh I don't know. That's very silly. Uh uh, that seems like a good place to bookend this, right? Do you have any other thoughts on um, on American Psycho? 
Only that it's still definitely worth seeing if you've never seen it. If you've only experienced it through memes, it is worth it is worth watching. It, it is like his performance is one for the ages. If you don't understand why Christian Bale became famous, this was the role that that did it. And it's um, it is it's a dark comedy that is so dark that I think a lot of people didn't necessarily get that it was a comedy in the same way that I watched Tar recently. Um, another film that's getting a lot of, uh, have you seen that one yet? I am not yet. I'm going to soon though. That is another one where I was, cover it. I was very surprised to find out after the fact that it is a comedy. I did not know. <laughs> I watched the entire thing and did not get that it was the whole thing was a black comedy and that the final scene, but I, which I will not spoil for you is the punchline to what was a big, long, very dark, uh, joke. I think same thing here. It, like, because of the because of the subject matter, and the same way that I think Fight Club is a very very funny movie. Um, but if yeah, you don't and have that a, one feels like a punchline too. Yeah, if you don't have a particular sense of humor, you will not perceive it <laughs> as well. Yeah, as there's such. there's a but, yeah there's a whiplash here where there are scenes that are genuinely upsetting and scenes that are silly and funny. I actually watched this with someone who hadn't seen it before, uh, and they uh, they were laughing. Uh, and again, it's the it's a reminder of like, uh, you know, I'm sure they knew all the memes, uh, uh, the sort of, uh, I'm sure pop culture they knew. But I asked them if they knew the ending and they were like, no, no, I don't. Uh, and uh, like it all worked. You know what I mean? Like the Huey Lewis scene, it killed. Like, and so it's nice to remember like, right, that's why this scene is famous. That's why this is so good. Because it is easy to forget when you've seen a film so much like why it, it's like going back and watching Casablanca and you're like, right, this is a really good film, isn't it? Like, uh, that's why everybody talks about this film. Uh, and this, yeah, I think is no different. Um, well, cool. Jason, thank you so much for doing this. I forgot to ask you to do plugs at the top. So I will now uh, ask you to do, uh, to, to tell the world uh, what you're up to here and now. Yes, the next book is up for pre-order. It is called Zoe is Too Drunk for This Dystopia. It is part of the sci-fi uh, Zoe Ash novels. There are two of them prior to that. Um, so if you've not read those yet, now would be a good time. The book's out later this year. If you can pre-order it and you know you want it, please do pre-order it at any local bookstore if you can. Although virtually no one will do that. They will do it at Amazon. But still, if there is mm -hmm. a store you can support they love it when you go to the counter and say, hey, there's this book coming out in October, but I want to order it now. It's, oh, yeah. and, and it means a lot to the publisher because this is what tells book chains how many copies to stock. This is what signals to them how much interest there is, is the pre-orders. So if you don't understand why would I pre-order a book without, if it's not a game where there's like a bonus chapter for pre-orders. And you get free <laughs> DLC and a free uh, skin for your character. I realize that the pre-ordered book is the exact same product and that they're not going to run out. I get it. The reason you do it, it helps authors tremendously. And in fact, at the level of author I'm at, it's pretty much everything. Can you not offer a DLC? Can you can you do a, like a free skin on the book? You get the happy uh, ending. You get the happy ending of the book if you pre-order. Otherwise, you get the yeah. sad ending. It's if you Right. Wanna... If anything, you can... <laughs> You can just promise that and then lie too. That works just as well, I think. Um, yeah, everybody, check that out. Go to a bookstore. Uh, they'll be they'll be thrilled if you just go to a bookstore too and pre-order it. Um, well, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, thank you to Harrison Millie, by the way, uh, our 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 producers who 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 you know asked for this movie. Uh, and uh, I guess I should plug the Patreon for gamefully unemployed for a second i forgot i forgot how podcasts end for a second um listen go to patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed uh we have a bunch of exclusive podcasts on there tom and jeff watch batman fox Mulder's maniac star trek the next futurama spiel boys we watch movies every friday night with our patrons uh this actually this is one of those movies where i'm like i i don't know if i'd watch this on a movie night now watching i'm like it's not actually that violent i guess it's upsetting i don't know doesn't matter uh, and, uh, yeah, watch this movie if you haven't and anything else. I think that's it. I don't know whether um, or not to recommend the book. It's probably very problematic in many ways, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, that's not, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to recommend that book, but, uh, you know, if you like something, some real fucked up shit, check out the book. 
Might as well. Reading, you know, it's good for you. It's education. And yes, books, books are good. That's the thing to take away from this episode. <laughs>